If I go to West Berkeley or South Berkeley, I can get menthol cigarettes for up to 43 cents cheaper than I can in the rest of Berkeley. Uh, there's a lot of predatory marketing going on by tobacco companies and our Tobacconist Club here at BCC and at Laney and at Merritt, we're trying to do something about it. We're trying to get the word out to the community. Um, I'm Pauline Bondano with Community Health Education Institute. Uh, in Berkeley itself, almost one out of five deaths is caused directly by tobacco. And it's happening in much larger proportion to people with darker skin. And part of it has to do with the absorption that, uh, that of nicotine that occurs with menthols. So we're lucky enough today to have Dr. Phil Gardner here to talk to us about menthols and what's going on in our communities. Uh, Joseph, just for a moment, is going to tell us something about the club here. And then I'll introduce Dr. Gardner. How's it going today, guys? So for those, of you who <coughs> for those of you who don't know me, my name is Joseph. I'm the president of the Tobacco List Club. You guys can call me Mr. President. I don't mind. Um, we, meet every, we meet every Wednesday in room 54, which is right down this hall. We offer, we, we offer paid jobs. We always have free lunch. So I welcome you guys to come on by. We're going to be having an art show coming up in, on April 23rd. So that means that there is going to be an art contest. Anybody who, anybody who has any questions about that, come, you guys can come find me. You guys can always find me in the student government office right there, or you can send us an email, tobaccolessclub at gmail.com. I'll hand the microphone back to Mama Sunshine. and everybody who's here today to promote this. So Dr. Gardner is a researcher, a health advocate, an evaluator. Um, he has many titles, many wonderful things he's been doing. He worked with the city of Chicago to help ban menthol cigarettes within 500 feet, I guess, of school and other facilities. Um, he comes to us from the University of California Office of the President, where he's the uh, program officer for tobacco-related diseases program research. He's also with a steering committee for the National Conference on Tobacco on Health, which he was with in 2009, and the Nas national co-chair for the second conference on mentholated cigarettes in 2009. He's co-editor for the Society for Nicotine and Tobacco Special Journal Supplement called Menthol Cigarettes Toward a Broader Definition of Harm. Um, Dr. Gardner, he said that actually more Less is more, so instead of reading his whole list, I'm going to cut to the chase. He's the co-chair of the African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council, which is a group of black professionals dedicated to fighting the scourge of tobacco impacting the Afri -Amer African American community, both in California and nationally. So we're really pleased to have him here today, and I wanted to welcome him. And we, we'll be serving pizza in a little while, and we'll serve it to anybody who's sitting down here today. Thanks for joining us. And we have information in the back here on tobacco prevention on our club. And if anybody's interested in quit information, there is a clinic coming up, too. We'd be happy to provide you with whatever you need. Thank you, Pauline. And, and thank folks who um, have taken a moment to um, listen to this. I've done this for the last um, 20 years or so. The reason I start with this slide is that African American smoking prevalence is about mid-range. Okay, it's not a lot, it's not the lowest, and it's not the highest. But we disproportionately do certain things that other smokers don't do. We smoke fewer cigarettes per day, we take fewer puffs per cigarette. We metabolize nicotine slower. The, the metabolite of nicotine in your body is called cotinine. We have scientific evidence that shows in African Americans it stays in the body twice as long, or what we have a clearance rate of 50% compared to other groups. 
We smoke cigarettes with higher nicotine content. Often menthol cigarettes have more nicotine in them, and then as I tell you a little bit more about menthol, you'll see the, the significance of that. We begin smoking later in life, and what I'm here to talk to you today about is that we disproportionately smoke menthol cigarettes, and where that came from, I think, is what we need to figure out, or at least I'm going to point out to you where I think it came from. Unfortunately, these are the, um, the facts as we know them. Um, I don't know what happened to my real pointer. <laughs> the point is here, these are African American males. These are cancer incidence rates. The highest incidence rates in the country. These are the death rates. African American males have the highest death rates from cancer in the country. If you look at African American women, they almost have, they have higher death rates than any of the other men of, of color. So there's something going on here. Um, sure, we don't have health care, we don't have, there's poverty, there's discrimination, there's segregation, there's a multiplicity of health determinants going on here. But one thing that is also going on, this is the slide I was talking about. I'm sitting at my desk, it's 19, 98, Surgeon, actually it was 97 because we got the early edition, the Surgeon General report comes out and I'm sitting here looking at this chart. Um, if you look at this, this row here, African Americans, males, die disproportionately, and these are all cancer related or tobacco related diseases, oral cancer, esophageal cancer, lung cancer, coronary heart disease, cerebrovascular disease, stroke, across the board, highest, period. Even though this was some 15 years ago, this data is still, I'm gonna show you some more recent data, but this is what got me involved in this discussion. Let's jump ahead to 2007 and look at, um, again, these are um, age-adjusted incidence rates, and these are the different um, groups. I'm just gonna look at the lung cancer. This data here we just showed you. Look at the male lung cancer rates for African Americans. They're almost twice as, twice as much. Why is that? Where is that coming from? So I think the point of this is, is that why do we have such high lung cancer, both incidence rates and mortality rates? And I think that's the question that was posed to me, at least that I'm trying to figure out. Okay. This is a heart disease slide from the Centers for Disease Control where African Americans have disproportionately high heart disease. Let me just say something here. Where this presentation goes now is someplace different. I could spend the next hour going through the different social determinants of health and what the racial differences are. Um, let me suggest to you, unfortunately, we're not gonna be able to do that today. Um, whether we're looking at AIDS, whether we're looking at diabetes, whether we're looking at um, pre, um, premature death at birth, um, African Americans unfortunately are at the top of all those lists. I actually teach a course on health disparities at Toro University. It's a graduate medical college and we go into this in, in a lot more depth. What we are going to talk about today is the African Americanization of menthol cigarettes and where this came from. If you take anything away from what I said today, anything, take this slide. This is what I'd like you to take away. In 1953, only 5% of African Americans smoked menthol cigarette. By 1968, that had tripled. By 1976, it had tripled again. By 2008, it had doubled. So, Something outrageous took place over the last 50 years that led from hardly any use at all to disproportionate use. Um, these are the actual facts and figures. Gentlemen had asked me for the slides. What I try and do on most of the slides you see, they're backed up with the actual data um, and scientific evidence. So one thing that did happen is that Brown and Williams began to say, well, you have a brand new group of people coming into the urban market be appraised that it was during World War II that many African Americans made the trip from the South to many of the industrial centers. 
and they began to produce specialty products for them. And it was the brainchild of some people in the tobacco industry that we would have different smokes for different folks. How they went about it is that Brown and Williamson had targeted 91% of their advertising budget um, to television. They had data that showed that African Americans watched more television than their white and other counterparts. They began to use male actors with more black features. As this became more popular, they saw that this would be more um, consumerable for that population. Cigarette advertising ebony tripled. Indeed, by 1976, the only cigarette ads in ebony were for menthol cigarettes. That is modified now, but by then it was the race is on. I'm going to get into the race, um, the fight for the market share in the African American community. Tobacco, to, tobacco manufacturers began to use menthol's got a brand new bag using the idiom of James Brown um, of the 1960s and early 70s. We're all aware of the cool jazz festival, cool lexicon, cool became a word. It was also a cigarette. It's not only a state of mind. I guess what's heartbreaking about all of this is the philanthropy. Um, the tobacco industry has consistently, historically given money to religious, civic, um, and political organizations within the African American community. My colleague Valerie Yerger, who's at UCSF, wrote a, has written a great paper on this some years ago. Unfortunately, it's still true, called Smoking with the Enemy. Um, whether it's the Urban League, the NAACP, Alvin Ailey, Dance Troupe, the California Legislative Black Caucus, all of them, all of them, all of them take money. And we have documentation to show that. This is an ad for a menthol cigarette in 1958. Your basic, Salem refreshes your taste, white couple in a meadow, kicking it. By the mid-60s, we had Elston Howard, some of us who know who Elston Howard is, um, African-American catcher for the New York Yankees, um, is selling cools. By 1970, we have brother with a dashiki, with afro, beads, and of course, using the idiom, a whole new bag of menthol smoking. Um, this is from an Ebony magazine in 1970. By 1976, the whole basketball um, image of African Americans is being used by Newport. Notice it says Newport alive with pleasure. I'll come back to that in a couple of slides. This is a great picture. Winston trying to get in on the game. This is from 1976 also. Um, rich, real and rich and cool. This is what menthol cigarettes are supposed to be about. This is from um, actually 2002. This is Newport Pleasure. Remember it was Newport alive with pleasure? By then it's Newport Pleasure because it became clear and we all know that Cigarettes kill you and using a live with their slogan as a cigarette company was not going to prove to be profitable So they dropped a live no pun intended um, This is of course another this is from 2004 for cool cigarettes and What's important about this slide here? Um, this is a cool mix campaign in 2004 one of the last acts of Brown and Williamson before they got bought up by RJR um, Reynolds was to call the Cool Mix campaign, um, Cool Mix um, um, competition. DJs from across the country to meet in Chicago to do a um, scratching contest. Um, there were going to be prizes, there were going to be um, parties, and et cetera, et cetera. The Attorney General of Illinois and the Attorney General of New York went up to court, sued, and got this blocked. What's important about what I'm showing that was, of course, not just them. There was the Tobacco Act. What's important about what I'm showing you, each one of these images here is a pack of cigarettes and how this is marketed. And look who it's marketed to. If it took the dashiki in 1970, it took hip hop in the 2000s. Okay, it's the same group of people being marketed to by the tobacco industry. <clears throat> in the 1980s, leading up to this, if you saw those advertising, we have a phenomenon that went on in the 80s called the 
what we'll call the cigarette sampling vans, or what my friends call the menthol wars. Menthol vans were stationed in African-American communities throughout the country. They knew the key parks, they knew the key intersections, they knew what time of day to go to. Go to. They're giving away free cigarette samples, even though they will say that they stopped giving away free cigarette samples in the 1970s. We have documentation, because we've gotten to the um, tobacco industry documents, where they actually talk about giving away free cigarettes. This, okay, this is, this is what they do. Um, again, my colleague, um, Dr. Yerger, worked on this. They knew the street corners, they'd have loudspeakers, they'd have music playing, and they'd be selling death. Well, actually giving it away in this case. This is what it looked like. This is from the tobacco industry itself, okay? This is what it actually looked like. Um, my pointer got up and disappeared on me. Remember what I talked about? If you look at Cools, look about right there where Brown and Williamson's put all their money and all their money and all their money. That's, that's how you get that to happen, is that you predatory market it. Up and down and up and down they go, Salem down, cool down, Newport. Newport is your, new, Newport is your menthol leader. It has been since the early 90s um, and is probably the main cigarette in the new R.J. Reynolds, um, Laura Lord proposed merger that is planned to take place um, earlier, well, supposed to take place in March or uh, April of this year. The menthol wars, and this is graphically put. So let me talk a little bit about menthol um, and what's up with that. The key thing with menthol is that it's a candy flavoring that masks the harsh taste of tobacco smoke and essentially helps the poison to go down easier. easier. We know there's 4,000 chemicals and 62 carcinogens in a, in a regular cigarette. Um, if you add menthol to it, it makes it easier to digest, to inhale. And that's what they do. Um, cooling sensation activates taste buds, cold receptors. I don't want to put too sharp of a point on it, but if you can cool down your throat enough, you can inhale more deeply. And if you inhale more deeply, you take in more smoke, and if you take in more smoke, you take in more nicotine. And this is why we think that African Americans die disproportionately from this, is because they're taking in more poison um, because of the, the um, irritation is less. Actually, there's an article that came out, and I don't want to put too sharp of a point on this, last week in a, in a scientific journal that did this study with rats that self-administer. And they found that the rats that self-administered the menthol cigarettes compared to the um, plain cigarettes administered it more, inhaled more deeply, and took in more nicotine. This is why they do this. Let me say something about Activate's taste buds. Menthol actually scientifically is an irritant, but be given its properties of cooling and its taste, it, get, it sends a different signal to the brain. People like, um, people like hot sauce, they put hot sauce on things. It's an irritant too. What we find out is that the active ingredient, capsaicin, in hot sauce stimulates the same taste buds that menthols do. We funded a study in Davis, UC Davis, that actually did the study that showed that the same t taste buds were activated when you use menthol or you use capsaicin. Tobacco industry knows this. That's why they put it in cigarettes. It mimics bronchial dilation. The tobacco industry responded to some of this and says, well, the bronchi doesn't really get larger, but what it does is when you inhale something that's cool, quote unquote refreshing, it sends a signal to the brain that you can inhale more deeply. It mimics bronchial dilation and you take in more of the poison, okay? Um, easier to inhale and more nicotine is in, taken in. We know that um, it activates neurotransmitters in the brain. The basic thing going on with smoking is that when you inhale cigarettes, it penetrates into your avilia that sends a signal to the brain that nicotine receptors are released and they activate what we call the dopaminergic pathway, meaning it releases dopamine, endogenous dopamine in your brain, and you go, ah, 
That's what all this is about, okay? When you add menthol to that process, it activates neurotransmitters on its own and reinforces what's going on with the nicotine. It's a double whammy, okay? Let's make no mistake about it. Um, let me just, because I was working on this a little earlier today, if you're a kid and you're between the ages of 18 and 24 and your brain doesn't really fully settle into development until you're 25 or 26, when you intake in nicotine, it will alter what we call your plasticity and affect your prefrontal lobe, which is where executive functions are made, meaning that you're liable to do things that you shouldn't do. If menthol is helping you to take more nicotine in, then you're being impacted by this process even more. And that's what I would suggest is going on. Um, increase of salivary flow or transbuchal drug absorption. These are big words that meaning if you chew tobacco that has menthol in it, it crosses your gum barrier more effectively if you compare to tobacco that doesn't have menthol in it. Similarly, and probably the main issue here, is greater cell permeability, meaning that cigarette smoke that has menthol in it will penetrate cells in your lung and your bronchii and your avelia much more effectively if it has menthol in it compared to cigarette smoke that doesn't. We have data on this. Those are the citations. It's, this, is not, this is not made up. Um, menthol is harder to quit. This is your basic quit attempts. As you notice, menthol smokers had more quit attempts, but menthol smokers were less effective at quitting. This data, even though I'm showing this from 2011, we have this data back 15, 16 years, and it continues to come in. It's harder to quit smoking menthol cigarettes. The joke on the street is, is that menthol cigarette is that you're quitting two things. You're quitting nicotine and you're quitting menthol. I mean, that's colloquial and that's not scientific, but that's essentially what's going on and why it's harder to quit. And not to put, not to call them by their first name, but the tobacco industry puts menthol in all cigarettes. All cigarettes. Not just menthol cigarettes. Marlboros, camels, all of them. Even though they have specialty brands, Camel, you know, Crush, and all of that, but regular Camels have menthol in it. Regular Marlboros have menthol in it. Why do they all have menthol in it? For all of these reasons I just showed you. Okay? The, the tobacco industry is aware of it. What's interesting is that regular or your menthol cigarettes just have more menthol in it and create that and make those processes much more dominant um, as they do it. Predation. The action of attacking or plundering where a predator, in this case the tobacco industry, feeds on its prey, in this case the African American community and other marginalized groups. Okay. Let's talk about this predation. This slide is from La Tanisha Wright. La Tanisha Wright was a member of Brown and Williamson's um, cool mix campaign in 2004. She was so appalled by what she saw, she left the tobacco industry, took documents with her, brought it out and brought it to the tobacco control movement. What we came to find is that the tobacco industry had its own lingo, its own language to talk about this in. And the language they talked about were focused versus non-focused communities. Focused communities, of course, were inner city, colored, poor, and black, where things were less exempt expensive and promotions more desirable. Then, of course, you had the non-focused community. I love the, the juxtaposition. There's the focus and the non-focused communities, um, where these were essentially upscale, suburban, rural, and white. Okay. This is their language. These are their documents. This is how they see you, how they see us, and how they market, it, market this stuff. I guess the thing that pissed me off most about when I read this and other things like this was menthol cigarettes were cheaper. They were cheaper across the board. I'm going to show you some data on that. This is a study um, from Lisa Erickson. She's Henriksen, excuse me. 
She's at Stanford University. We funded her to do a study. And I guess the take home message here is, is as the enrollment of African American students went up in a given locale, the amount of advertising for menthol cigarettes went up proportionately. There's a dose response relationship. Just like you learn about other things in class, the more African Americans there were, the more menthol ads there were. This is published in 2011. She also find that Newport discounts were 1.5 times greater, that menthol advertising increased by 6%. Each of those steps was a 6% increase. Newport promotions were 42% higher compared to other brands. And the cost of Newport, again, was 12% cheaper. The greater the concentration of African Americans in a given geographical area, or, um, geographical area, the cheaper the cigarettes were. This was in California. This is Boston. In Boston, you have Brookline, a more upscale community, and Dorchester, which has historically had been black, but is more diverse now, but is essentially a poor colored community. Across the board, there were more, reach, there were more ads in Dorchester. There were larger ads in Dorchester. There were, of course, significantly more menthol ads. And the average price of a cigarette was 50 cents less. Across the board. This is not, not in California. This is in Boston. This is a national phenomenon. In fact, I have data that we didn't publish. A colleague of mine in College Park, Maryland, um, did a, a national retail store study. And we have the data that shows that this, this is true throughout the United States. The tobacco industry is aware of what they're doing. This is no mistake. This is one of their websites. This is Laura Lord's website. Grown-ups should have the freedom to choose whether to smoke regular menthol cigarettes. Here's, a, here's an African-American woman with dregs, um, dressed in the idiom. She's a young woman, and she has the right to choose. And I showed you the um, morbidity and mortality figures earlier. This is how insane this whole thing is. So I'm going to broaden the discussion here a bit. Um, it's not just African Americans, but it is predominantly African Americans. Adolescents, kids, start using these products. Millions of them do. And menthol cigarettes are generally used by more women than men. Keep in mind in the 1930s that this was who they were marketed to. What was profound about what happened in the 50s and 60s is they were able to take that market and turn it around and became a black male phenomena. Um, this is how a dude, I remember turning in the um, article, I wrote an article on this, and one of the reviewers wrote back, make sure that you mention this thing that I just mentioned, because this is, if you think the Marlboro Man was the leading ad of the 20th century, which they won the award for, the changing of menthol cigarette from being a woman cigarette to being an African American male cigarette was um, profound in and of itself. This is the basic data from the mid, from a few years ago. 82% of African Americans, adults, smoke menthol cigarettes. I'm going to talk about some of these other groups here in a moment. Kids disproportionately use menthol cigarettes. Why do they do that? It's easier to smoke them. It, 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 it tastes better, um, straight up. This is a great um, slide, colleague James Hershey at Wright Research Triangle, Triangle um, Park, North Carolina, his office is in DC. The point of this, though, is nearly 60% of all kids who are smoking cigarettes in middle school are smoking menthol cigarettes. 60%. Okay. And these are the ones we got data on. Okay. This is um, 12 to 17 year old. Even though African, what's interesting, African American rates continue to go up while others go down. I'll show you a slide on that shortly. Um, multiracial, Asian, Hispanic, all around 50% um, using menthol cigarettes. We actually know now that kids prefer the taste of flavored candied cigarettes um, and the like. This is another slide I'd like you to remember. 
Take a look at this slide. In the Hispanic community, going from middle school to high school, menthol use goes down. In the Asian community, menthol use goes down. White community, menthol use goes down. African American community, going from middle school to high school, use goes up. This is no mistake what's going on here. This, this is the tobacco industry has been very, very planned in terms of how they do it. It's not just African Americans. We can see from this slide when we disaggregate, and that's what I tell folks in the class, when you do health disparities, you have to disaggregate populations like Asian and Hispanic. When you disaggregate, we find that 62% of Puerto Ricans are using menthol cigarettes compared to um, Mexican Americans at only 20%. This is recent data too. Why is off the chart. Native Hawaiians, the menthol use, middle, this is terrible, I can't even, the middle thing, and this is all last decade from 61% to 78%, nearly 80% use, similar to African Americans. Puerto Ricans, Hawaiians, Filipinos. Menthol cigarettes constitute 55% of the cigarette market in 2007. You know, picking up a pattern here of poor communities of color being targeted marketing by the tobacco industry to disproportionately smoke um, mentholated cigarettes. So let me talk about a little of the fight back that needs to take place here. Um, Menthol, a sacrificial lamb. In 2009, in June, when President, o I hate this thing now. When President Obama signed the um, the Family um, Smoking Prevention Act, um, this was one of the clauses in it. The cigarette or any of its component parts, including tobacco filter and paper, shall not contain as a constituent, including smoke constituent or an additive, an ad artificial or natural flavor other than tobacco or menthol, or herb spice including, so it couldn't include strawberry, grape, orange, clove, cinnamon, pineapple, vanilla, coconut, licorice, cocoa, chocolate, cherry, or coffee, but it could include menthol, okay? This, is, this was the problem. Some of us fought back. Um, there was a front page article in 2008, in May of 2008, um, even above the fold, right above the fold, um, was an article on menthol being, Bill treats menthol with leniency. The National African American Tobacco Prevention Network, a uh, colleague organization of mine, the African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council, where I work, um, all came out against this and rallied people around this. Probably most effectively, though, was Joseph Califano and Louis Sullivan, past health and human secretary, health and health and health <laughs> health secretaries, um, sent a letter to Congress. They sent a letter to everybody in Congress. 435 um, people received the letter. And the punchline of the letter, and, and usually in a longer discussion, I would actually put parts of the letter up. It said essentially that we treat all our white children with such dignity, we should treat our African American children with the same respect and dignity, and, that we sh and given that, we should remove menthol. This letter hit, it began, this, the, the, the it began some motion. Um, some members of the Congressional Black Caucus took this up, particularly um, Donna Christensen from the Virgin Islands. Um, not everybody in the Congressional Black Caucus was in favor of this, but she was. She took it up and put forward the um, menthol amendment. <clears throat> By the way, the, as this is going on and distinct from um, what was going on, a paper comes out in the summer of 2008 or is in 2009 by Jennifer Cresslake when she was at um, Harvard and essentially showed that the tobacco industry had historically manipulated the amount of menthol in different cigarettes to ensure that it's uptake. Um, it's a great paper. Um, all this came about that led to this amendment. This amendment was, was signed by Obama based on all the work that had been done from the summer of 2008 to the summer of 2009. Um, immediately upon the establishment of the Tobacco Product Scientific Advisory Committee, the secretary shall refer to the committee for a report and recommendation the issue of the impact of the use of menthol in cigarettes on the public health, including such use 
among African Americans, Hispanics, and other racial and ethnic minorities. We got this in there. The first thing that this tobacco product scientific advisory committee was to do was to write a report. Scientists were on it. I knew half of them. Many of us went back to um, testify in March um, through November of 2010 that the FDA should do something about that. The FDA finally delivered its report in, on, in July of 2011. Um, the punchline of all of this says this. The removal of menthol cigarettes from the marketplace would benefit the public health of the United States. Duh. Um, so yeah, we, we knew this, and we got the scientific evidence to prove this. Um, we haven't heard word one from the FDA on this since. We know that menthol increases initiation. It retards cessation, particularly among African Americans. And menthol cigarettes are marketed disproportionately to younger smokers and disproportionately marketed per capita to African Americans. I just showed you all that data. I've known this for 15 years. FDA knows this. Everybody knows this. This is their report. So what are we going to do? Um, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going <laughs> to, let me just do this. Um, we have petitioned the FDA to ban menthol. My sense is the FDA isn't going to do anything, and I'll take questions about that as we can. But just for the sake of argument, menthol cigarettes are starter products for youth. FDA knows this. Menthol cigarettes have greater addiction potential given their unique sensory stimulation properties, which I just went over with you. We know it's the Ulta candy flavor and it helps the poison go down easier. Think about it this way. What has been waged over the last 50 years as a mass disinformation campaign? A lie, straight up, that somehow is a healthier alternative, soothes sore throats, refreshing, alive with pleasure, Unfortunately, African Americans, after being bombarded with that for 50 years, actually have bought into that. We have focus groups from the 1960s, from the 90s, from the 2000s, even the latest of 2010. I know we have even others, I just should update the slide, where African Americans say, yes, menthols are a healthier alternative. The tobacco industry has gotten this point across. They are winning this fight at this point and we need to do something about it. We talk about a cessation inhibitor. I talked about that. You're taking in more nicotine, thus making it harder for you to quit. Relapse promoter. This is a great little study done by Pletcher and folks at UCSF that they found that the folks who were in a cessation study, the people who were more likely to relapse were the people who were using menthol cigarettes. It's unfortunate, but we have data. Now, not all studies show this, but the preponderance of studies, if there are 10 studies, seven of them are saying what I'm saying. So the reason to ban menthol, frankly, it's a social justice issue. What you have happening is the predatory and relentless marketing to the most vulnerable populations, African Americans, Native Hawaiians, Filipinos, women, youth. We know that they're disproportionately marketed to the LGBT community. We know that the homeless community disproportionately uses menthol cigarettes. What did, what did um, Michael Brown, what was he trying to steal but a, a flavored cigar? And what was the brother um, Eric Garner doing? S selling cigarettes. It's a, it's a problem here um, of immense proportion. The disproportionate marketing and targeting of candy-flavored poison to African Americans and other specially oppressed sectors of our society is outright discriminatory and genocidal. Unfortunately, the data backs that up. The poorest, the least informed, folks with the fewest resources, indeed, it meets the definition of what preying on the most vulnerable section of our society is about. If menthol were banned, I talked to um, Levy about this, if menthol were banned, even if just 30%, he has the whole, the whole slide goes from 10 to 9, if just 30% of the people who were using menthol quit smoking cigarettes, the other 60% went on, okay? If, all, if only 30%, half, over half a million lives would be saved, 
and nearly a quarter, over a quarter of a million African Americans would be safe. If the FDA would do what they've already, they're already, they've already done, they already know that they should do. We should follow Chicago's lead, and this is what I've been going around the country talking to other people about. In 2013, Chicago enacted a 500-foot barrier around all schools to prohibit the sale of menthol and all flavored tobacco products. They had community-wide meetings where they talked with folks about it. They had an aggressive media campaign. This is part of the aggressive media campaign, burned by menthol cigarettes. Um, it was very aggressive. They talked about it. We actually testified in front of the Chicago City Council. It passed 48 to 2 or 48 to 3. Um, <laughs> let me just say that um, you should speak with your own elected officials. We've met with folks in Minnesota, both state and local officials, Minneapolis and St. Paul, and state officials in Minnesota, and are undertaking the same process there. Um, we have met with folks in Baltimore, Baltimore's predominantly African-American city, where we're going to actually introduce a legislation similar to Chicago to establish a 500 or 700 foot barrier. Um, we know that these, frankly, these are baby steps in this fight, but since the FDA isn't doing a damn thing about it, it's important that we do something about it. There's been a number of cities across the United States had that have meant that have um, fl um, flavor bans or proposed flavor bans. I even believe in um, Santa Clara County there's a flavor ban, but it doesn't include menthol. Everybody's shying away from it, um, but we need to kind of confront it. National organizations could pass resolutions like De Delta Sigma Theta passed a resolution calling for the banning of menthol. And this, uh, and this um, year, World No Tobacco Day um, is usually May 31st. May 31st this year falls on a Sunday. And we're calling for no menthol Sundays. Um, the link with this, with the religious community, I work with the group, the African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council, and, and one of its partner organizations, the National African American Tobacco Prevention Network, held a clergy meeting in Atlanta in August last year. Over 60 clergy from around the country were there to have this discussion. Um, we're calling, and you will, I should have brought flyers, calling for May 31st to be No Menthol Sunday and to have menthol educations um, throughout the United States. Not to put too sharp of a point on it, on June, June 1st, the day after, we hope to have the Baltimore legislation brought to the Baltimore City Council to begin the process we began in Chicago. So this is part of what, this is what I do. Um, what's at stake here? That he's at stake. We're at stake. Here he is, and we, we, you could have taken this picture anywhere in the country. He's sitting on his skateboard head backward, surrounded by cigarette ads. Okay, that's what's at stake here. Okay, this is the African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council. These are some of my colleagues in it. That's an older picture. This is a newer picture. Um, and anyway, let me thank you. Let me thank you all, and I'll take any questions that you have. Menthol cigarette was um, invented accidentally by a gentleman who put um, some menthol camphor on his chest and inadvertently put his cigarettes that he was um, using into it and left it there overnight, got up in the morning and smoked it. And that was 1926. By 1928 um, or 27, it had become what we call spud cigarettes. Um, Spuds was your first menthol cigarettes. By 1933, we had cools. Um, by 1956, you had Salem's, C Cools then, Salem's, Newport's by 1960, and the rest is history. Question, let me just repeat it, are there any long-term effect? People quit cigarettes all the time. Are there any difference between quitting menthols or quitting others? I smoked for 19 years, cool cigarettes, and quit just like you in, in my um, 30s when I quit. Um, I immediately had the benefit of being able to smell again. Um, and of course, my um, 
heart function um, improve dramatically. Um, I think the lung function will always be, I think we all, we, we all, we're going to pay a little bit for what we did. There's no free lunch here. Um, I don't think there's a difference that I know of, and I don't know, between people who've quit menthol and people who've quit regular cigarettes. Um, but clearly, um, I'm glad to hear your story. I have the same story, so, okay. Ma'am? So isn't that the $64,000 question, why did the FDA leave out menthol? Let me pose it to you in the broadest level. It's money, but let me, let me pose it to you. <laughs> no, the gentleman's correct, right on it. The tobacco industry in the United States is a $100 billion industry. It is outrageously huge. Menthol cigarettes make up about a quarter, maybe 23%, maybe up to 28% of that market. Not a large, but in a $100 billion market, that's $25 billion. That's why it was left out. Southern senators said they would not go along with the deal in 2009 if it were included in there. We, it's unfortunate if some of us, there were tobacco control folks at the table, some of them caved in essentially. Um, if I'd have been there, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't agree to it. But of course, that's why I'm not there. I'm not worth, the, I'm, I'm not worth $25 billion. Uh, uh, so yeah, it's a, it, that's, that's why. Um, let me even, her, her question's even more pertinent this way. The question is not so much, why wasn't it included? The question is, why haven't they done something about it since their own FDA found out it, the same things that I've been telling you? and they found this out in 2011, this 2015. I don't think the FDA has the wherewithal to do this. This is a thoroughly political decision that's made in the White House, okay? And as much as I'd like to defend a lot of things going on in the White House, um, we know that Eric Holder, who's done some good things at the same time, <coughs> worked for the main, to, the main legal firm for the tobacco industry. In fact, we know that there's 16 other lawyers in the White House who've worked for that same tobacco um, legal firm. I don't have, it's gonna take stuff like what we're doing at the local level to move the back it away from our kids, national organizations passing resolution getting congressional folks to stop taking their money, we're gonna to have to push it back like this. Because coming from upstairs, I don't think, Obama will leave office and we'll, I'll be making this speech to somebody else in Atlanta somewhere, unfortunately. So that's the importance of your question. Other questions? That you know that used to work for tobacco company, sixteen. Not at all. I mean, look at all the lawyers there are in the White House. I mean, what is the staff of two or three hundred people and all the legal consultants? These are mainly in the Justice Department. I mean, here you have a Justice Department that has overturned um, plain packaging, overturned warning labels, doesn't deal with the question of menthol. Do you think this is all by accident? <laughs> no, I know you don't know. Did when I tried to qu quit Cools, I started using regular cigarettes, and then I didn't. I, it was so they were so terrible that I I said I'm. They tasted terrible. I said I had to quit. The question was: She wasn't able to quit menthol cigarettes until she when she quit menthol cigarettes, she started using regular cigarettes, and then that's what allowed her to quit. That's the same experience that I had. <laughs> exact same experience. <laughs> Ma'am. Right. Two things are going on. Oh. <laughs> I believe the question was, um, about the metabolism of um, nicotine in the body. Um, in African-Americans, nicotine, 
its um, metabolite cotinine metabolizes slower in our bodies than in other groups. We have actually two or three good scientific papers on that, meaning the nicotine stays in your body longer. Secondly, and I don't know if I went, I, didn't, I may not have gone into this, we know that melanin, the thing in your skin that gives you color, um, we know that menthol is attracted to melanin and that the darker or more melanin you have, the more menthol stays in your body. You add those two factors together, um, plus the cell permeability and all this other stuff, this, this is a deadly combination, um, marketing. The, what's interesting about that is that the tobacco industry is aware of this also, um, and, have, and has been aware of it. I don't want to get anybody in trouble. Um, yes, I was in Baltimore during the blizzard two weeks ago. Um, we met with the NAACP, the Urban League, AFSCME, certain church folks, and a member of the Baltimore City Council, and are making plans to do what we did in Chicago. That's the same thing we did in Chicago. You ha if you're going to beat up on the tobacco industry, you have to kind of come at them quickly and sideways and you know, in Chicago, the tobacco industry sued the city of Chicago for implementing 500-foot barrier. Of, cor of course they are. They're going to they're gonna do stuff like that. The judge threw out the temporary restraining order. This just happened in November of um, last year. Threw out. The day that this thing was supposed to be implemented, it was passed in December of 2013, was supposed to be implemented in June. It was postponed till, until November because it was so complicated. There were so many flavored and menthol products in stores within 500 feet, they had to get a catalog, a list, and it took them months to compile it. In fact, Chicago's done a lot of the hard work, and that's what we've pointed out to folks in Minneapolis and in Baltimore. The day it was supposed to go public, I think it was November 1st, the tobacco industry sued. Um, the judge threw it out of court. It's still a case, they threw out the temporary restraining order, but there's still a court case. Um, but it's, it's been implemented, and I think that's, that's what's important. Um, in terms of this. CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, just put out a, a new report um, earlier this last month on the um, intake of secondhand smoke and African Americans are disproportionately impacted by secondhand smoke. If we add that they are more exposed to it, if they are more exposed to it, then if all these other things come into play, it's, it's a double whammy. It's more than a double whammy. It's triple whammy, I guess, or whatever. Other questions or comments? Okay, look, you guys, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Pauline. Thank you very much.